review um, this reflex activity. We talked about ascending tracks, descending tracks. Well, what does it all matter? How do we see this in the real world and our patients or ourselves? Heaven forbid that happens. But let's talk about some specific disorders related to damage to the spinal cord and damage to motor tracks. So in your um, worksheet packet, you have a page number that deals with flaccid paralysis, quadriplegia, paraplegia. I want to talk about that page. I'll tell you what page it's on. <coughs> Go to Two ninety eight, is that the page number? Yeah. Yes. Okay, page two ninety eight. So if we have a loss of sensation, what can we say about the type of damage occurring here? Loss of sensation. have damage to what type of tract? The ascending tract or sensory tract, depending on the sensation that's lost, right? Um, what if there's damage to a nerve? What part of the root would be damaged if I had loss of sensation? Dorsal. Right, the dorsal root, because that's where information. What horn in the gray matter of the spinal cord could be damaged that would cause loss of sensation? dorsal horn. So these are some questions that I'm going to ask you based on what we know about the tracks and information coming into the spinal cord, information going out. That's all going to lead to loss of sensation. And if I say, what if it's loss of temperature sensation? Then you'd have to tell me which tract is involved for loss of temperature sensation. Okay, so the term we use for loss of sensation is paresthesia. Paresthesia. So, and what does loss of sensation feel like? What's the number one worst s symptom that we know? Total loss. We call it numbness. Um, if it's starting to be affected, might lead to numbness. What happens before numbness? If you've ever tingling. slept on your arm or foot, you know what that feels like. Tingling. Yeah. So numb numbness or tingling we call paresthesia. That's the clinical term for that. That's loss of sensation. Number two is paralysis without atrophy. That means you can't, well, <coughs> what does paralysis mean? Can't move it. We can't move it. So what tract or what tract might be involved? What, what general category of tracts? Motor. Motor tracts are involved. And um, what part of the spinal cord within the spinal cord itself? What carries motor information? The ventral horn. The ventral horn carries the cell bodies of motor neurons. And the root, if it's a nerve damage thing, which root? Ventral. ventral root. Okay. So those are some things that would cause paralysis, right? Un unable to move. Now, this specific question is asking spastic paralysis, correct? Well, what that means, though, is when you have spastic paralysis, that means there's damage somewhere in the upper part of the motor tract. And what do we call that neuron that starts in the brain, starts in the motor cortex, and comes down the spinal cord? What is that neuron called? Upper motor neuron. Yeah. When we have upper motor neuron damage, we have what's called spastic paralysis because the lower motor neuron is still intact. And we know there's always, because of the stretch reflex, there's always sensory information based on the muscle spindle activity. There's always sensory information coming into the spinal cord and reflexing right back out to cause contraction. Does everybody agree with that? We talked about that last time. Okay. This is not just when we tap our knee. This is happening continuously to give our muscles tone. If I squeeze your muscles, anybody in this class right now, they're not going to be mush because you have muscle tone. You have constant activity, constant sensory information coming in from your muscles to keep them a little bit contracted. But now, what if you have damage to that upper motor neuron? For example, a baby that's uh, born with cerebral palsy, 
because of damage in utero, um, something congenital, um, damage uh, during infancy, sometimes shaken baby syndrome causes cerebral palsy, causes damage to that motor cortex, or uh, difficult, difficulty during birth, loss of oxygen shortly after birth or during birth. You see sometimes that with twins. Anybody know twins where one twin is healthy and the other one has cerebral palsy? I know a couple. Okay, well, that happens because of difficulties in utero and during birth. So anyway, that's damage to the upper motor neuron. So they can't consciously move those parts, or maybe they can a little bit, but it's very uh, sporadic and irregular. And if you look at someone who has cerebral palsy, don't they have very curled uh, joints when you look at them? Their hands are curled inward, their legs are, are pointed inward, and they have that constant contraction. And when they try to move, it's very difficult for them because the lower motor neuron is intact, but it's irregular. That reflex activity is irregular because there's nothing to inhibit that motor activity from above because we know IPSPs are constantly coming down the spinal cord to inhibit extra motor activity. And we talked about how in Parkinson's disease, remember the basal nuclei are not sending those IPSPs down to inhibit motor activity and you have constant firing of action potentials and all that extra movement with Parkinson's disease. So cerebral palsy is an example of where you have constant muscle contraction and when muscles are constantly contracted, they shorten. And when they shorten, they're pulling on tendons, which pull on joints, which pop the, the limbs out of position. For example, it's very common, what I learned when I started on pediatrics, is we have patients right around three years old that are born with cerebral palsy that have to come in and get uh, special surgery in their legs to get uh, <coughs> ligaments, tendons, and muscles cut. And their femur, the, the ball of the femur, actually has to be broken and reset because their legs are curling inward because of the constant contraction in those lower leg muscles that it causes their feet to cross and then they can't sit in a, in a wheelchair and their hips pop out, the femur pops out of the acetabulum and it's causing a lot of pain. So they have to reconstruct those muscles, you know, cut the muscles, lengthen them and then they can sit properly in a wheelchair. So it's a very common surgery and very difficult for those kids. They cut them. So that's an example of what we call spastic paralysis. So there's sensory information coming in, but um, the response is exaggerated because of damage to the upper motor neuron. Um, if we look at the other type of paralysis, so what's the next one in our list on the worksheet? Loss of motor function. So that means you, you can't move. What do we call that loss of motor function? Paralysis. Yeah, that's paralysis. So we talked about um, spastic paralysis. We'll talk about flaccid paralysis here now. So traumatic flexion and or extension of the neck. Everybody knows that one. Whiplash, you get hit by a car, you either are forced forward or backward. <coughs> that can definitely cause damage to the spinal cord or brain. The next one is actually but cutting the spinal cord between T of the between 11 and L1. So you're below the level, you're about the level of the waist, you know, the high waist, just below your rib cage. If you cut your spinal cord from there down, what type of? Paraplegic. Paraplegic, yep. So you're paralyzed, can't move from the waist down. transient period of functional loss induced by trauma to the spinal cord. This happened to a football player, a friend of my son's. He got hit really hard um, <coughs> playing football and he was completely paralyzed for 24 hours. And everybody was just totally upset. Parents, everybody, the whole community was, you know, thinking, oh my goodness, he's paralyzed now from the neck down. And slowly but surely, after 24 hours, he started to get some tingling, some sensation, and he's back playing football this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, soccer is more dangerous than football. Is did you know that? I the did most, because there's no yeah. protection whatsoever. Yeah, or just you know, any, anything. And my daughter played soccer, and the biggest problem they had was concussions, multiple concussions from kids banging heads, falling hard, smacking into people, you know, full force. So anyway, um, so what do we call that? Inflammation of the spinal cord, spinal shock. Yep. And then the next one is permanent injury to the cervical region of the spinal cord. Right? Christopher Reeves fell 
off a horse, broke his neck. And then he was in a quadriplegic jump. And paralysis on one side of the body? Hemiplegia. Hemiplegia. Now, where we see hemiplegia is with a stroke because there's an artery that has a blood clot and it damage, you know, this causes loss of blood supply to that side of the brain, that cerebral hemisphere, and we know that those neurons cross over, right, and control the other side of the body. Same thing with certain sensations. So therefore, we see flaccid paralysis in that case, and why is that? Loss of muscle tone because, or on that side of the body. We have loss of sensation and loss of motor control. So if you look at people with um, stroke, you'll see the one side of their body is very floppy and atrophied. So they have to do lots of physical therapy to get those muscles to come back and retrain the brain. It's amazing, even though one part of the brain might be permanently damaged and those neurons are lost, we find that surrounding areas of the brain can actually pick up for some of those functions with lots and lots of work and training. So when you take a person with a stroke and you plop them in a nursing home and nobody's working for them, you know, encouraging them to let's keep doing this, come on, you can get better, they're just going to atrophy and, and not progress and, and get back to normal living. But you see those people at the YMCA that are getting on the machine and they're, you know, working hard. I think good for you because that's the way you're going to get back. And um, I have a stepdaughter who's a speech pathologist and she talks about um, her stroke patients, this one guy, he had such difficulty talking, he had expressive aphasia, which means he knew the words in his head he wanted to say, but he couldn't get them to come out of his lips, um, she said, and he was just really, really struggling, but he worked, and she'd give him assignments to do at home, and he would work and work and work and work, and he's doing so much better six months later because he's determined to get his ability to communicate back, because he was a pastor, mm. and he's someone who likes to talk and share <laughs> what he knows. So he's very inspired. She said then she has other people that have had less damage, less issues, that don't progress because they just, uh, it's hard, and poor me, I've had the stroke, and I'm just a poor thing. So um, a lot of that motivation, you can rewire the brain. Yes? Are you saying that it's like a psychological therapist or not only stroke patients, but um, any kind of brain surgery or anything that involves sudden brain interference? Oh, okay. They do that um, kind of based on your blood history. Mm -hmm. I would be curious what yeah. you thought. certainly can't. No. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. And they don't tell you that they have brain interference. You hear it in their voices. And yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those supportive people you know, make a big difference. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so another thing with flaccid paralysis. What we find with flaccid paralysis is when we, when we don't have that reflex activity intact, it's because there's damage to the ventral horn. So flaccid paralysis most commonly is caused by damage to the ventral horn. That's the cell bodies that are involved in that. So we're looking right here on our diagram. We're looking at the ventral horn right here. So if there's damage there, that impulse can't go back out and contract those muscles. So we call it flaccid because those muscles will atrophy and, and just disappear because they, they break down. If muscles aren't used, they break down and the body absorbs them. So um, we see this in polio. Polio is a disease that is caught uh, or acquired in poor sanitation environments like third world countries. We've really done a good job on eliminating polio in most of the world. Um, so you don't see it too much here. And now we have people saying let's not vaccinate ourselves against polio because it's not around. Well, it will come around. There are a few people in third world countries that still are harboring polio. So if we don't vaccinate, we're going to see those diseases. That's nice for my video. Um, so we're going to start to see those diseases come back, just like Ebola. I, I'd be curious to see the anti-vaccination folks, how their response is going to be if we do come up with a vaccine for Ebola and we have a pandemic here in the United States. Will they say, I'm just going to eat my spinach and drink my super juice to prevent Ebola? I don't know. I think that's a, a big risk to take. He, 
because they need to try to increase those antibodies. He's just one person, so he doesn't have tons of antibodies to provide. He just has, just you know, what he, what he can provide. So we have to figure out how to, because what we do is we take um, the antibody and we inject it into different cells and they make <laughs> tons more for us. So we have to figure out where we're going to do that, how we can get that process going, and make sure that, um, and when I say that, okay, I should back pedal, back pedal here. <coughs> when you get um, a vaccination, you're not getting antibodies. You only get antibodies when you've already been infected, like you get bit by a snake, you're going to get antibodies um, in the, what we call an anti-serum, and that's a, in a limited quantity. We don't have that to to, popu to vaccinate or to treat an entire world population. That's only useful on a very limited basis. When, yes, a, a protein, right, a protein from the virus, something to trigger your own immune system to make antibodies, and that happens over a period of time. So you can't vaccinate someone who's sick. It's too late for them. They're going to build their own antibodies if they survive the disease. But now you have to try to figure out how to get that virus, those viral, virus infected cells from killing the host. And so right now they're giving antibodies to the people that are infected to help them protect the host from being killed by the virus. But that's only on a very small scale that they can do that. And they need someone available with the antibodies to provide, so that's how that one person is surviving right now, which is a wonderful thing. But how do we pick and choose? Right now we're picking and choosing because we only have two United States people that have been infected that we can use that. The other guy came in too ill for that to work. There's three? I know. Why was she traveling? And Why she was she over traveling? She had overage fever and then she just came in on Sunday or whatever and um, got to the airport and the doctor said she had to go to the hospital. And so now they're trying to check on all the people that were on the plane with her. Yeah. yeah. And then Phil's the only one that is going to go to Russia. So. Yeah. Yeah. So this is going to be a, a big problem. And we do need to develop a vaccine, but we had an HIV vaccine for a short period of time. But they found uh, when they went through the first clinical trial that it actually increased the chance of getting HIV by 40 percent. So it worked initially, but then the long-term results is that increased your chance of getting HIV. Oh, for sure. Did you hear that? Uh, speaking of Trump, um, <laughs> his daughter donated 50 million dollars towards the Ebola fight. 50 million dollars. So when we criticize the very rich, you know, they're not all rotten people. You know? <laughs> they, yeah, well, 50 million, though. I mean, that's huge. Right, yeah, yeah. That's huge. No, right, right, right. Okay, so back to this then. Oh, so flaccid paralysis, polio is an example. And another one is ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. You've heard of that? That's where we, we have damage to the um, ventral horn. So um, with that, ALS and polio, why do people die? They used to have this thing called the iron lung that they used to put people years ago, way before we were around, but back in the 40s. People would get polio, and then they couldn't breathe because it would cause paralysis of your muscles. Well, what important muscle do we need for breathing? Diaphragm. The diaphragm. So anytime, and this will be on the test, anytime we have damage to acetylcholine releasing neurons or a receptor for acetylcholine on a skeletal muscle cell, we lose action potential in that muscle. And if we lose action potential in that muscle, it can't contract. And if it's my arms and legs, no big deal. But if it's my diaphragm and my diaphragm can't contract, what important respiratory motion can I not do? Which part of breathing can I do? Inhale. You can't inhale. <coughs> or worse yet, there's some things that actually cause chronic contraction. They, because um, we need an enzyme to break down acetylcholine so it diffuses away and then our muscles can relax. Well, if acetylcholine stays bound because we have a disease, or not a disease, sorry, a toxin, like curare, is something they put in poison darts. 
and sarin gas that Saddam Hussein used on his people. When they inhale that, it causes, it binds to uh, acetylcholine receptors and causes constant contraction of the diaphragm. So now you die because you can't exhale. Yeah, so you can't exhale. So that's how they killed um, people is by affecting those receptors at the neuromuscular junction and either blocking or promoting its binding so you can't inhale or exhale, one or the other. So people with Lou Gehrig's disease, what do they die from? Inability to breathe, suffocation, yeah. Their diaphragm doesn't contract. So we get really upset when we can't breathe, right? You get <gasps> anxious and all that, and that's a horrible way to die. But I can tell you the good news is, is there's medicines that block that response that, oh, I'm not breathing well, I'm not getting oxygen. And that drug is, do you know? The most common one, there's others, morphine. morphine. Morphine suppresses your response to poor oxygenation. So that's why when you put morphine on someone who just had their hip replaced, we want to put a little sensor in their nose to make sure that they're breathing enough, a CO2 sensor to make sure that they're blowing off their CO2 and they're breathing enough so they don't just fizzle away and die in their sleep. Because if you suppress the low oxygen, the, the drive to breathe with with a pain reliever like that, they can die. So it's really important. Anybody who's getting morphine by um, IV push or by a drip, that we put that oxygen sensor, not oxygen, CO2 sensor on them to make sure that they're breathing adequately because they will just die in their sleep if we don't pay attention to that. So if they take a pill, that's not necessarily an inhalation that's going to happen? No, I'm typically not. not, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sublingual morphine, because they don't have to swallow it in the digestive tract. It just absorbs through their cheek. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's our kind way of just kind of hurrying the process along. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it comes to this. This person is loaded with cancer. They're dying. Do we want to say, oh, we don't want you to get addicted to morphine, or we don't want to give yeah. you too much. <laughs> we want you to hang around for another three hours and suffer. Cause, and, but you don't just give them a bunch to end it like that. But if they're wiggling and they seem uncomfortable, then you increase the dosage. You don't make them wiggle and be uncomfortable and die uncomfortable. All we do is give them enough morphine that they're not uncomfortable. And then you don't touch it, you don't keep upping it. That would be mercy killing and we don't do that. But if they're in discomfort, then you up the dose until they're at a comfort level. Poor lady, she was probably active her whole life, had a strong heart, well, strong heart and lungs, and those people take longer. Yeah, 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 that is tough. But yeah, so when you use morphine at end of life, we don't worry about addiction issues or anything like that. They build a resistance so you can't get it. Mm hmm, yep, yep. So you have to increase the dosage, and yeah. Okay, so did that cover our worksheet? Did we have. <coughs> Anesthesia, paralysis, what tract is involved, what part of the horn is involved, dorsal or ventral, what root of the spinal nerve might be involved. Those are all application questions. Because when you get to advance, it's not just what is this, what is that. Like in general, it's more let's apply this now. Okay. And that's what you want to do with your patients too, is be able to take this information and say, I know why this is happening. When they say, I don't want to go to physical therapy today, I'm tired. You have to say, oh, that's too bad. Because if you don't go to physical therapy, you can't prove that you're ready to go home and we're going to have to take you to a nursing home instead. Oh, okay, I'll go to physical therapy then. And, and then you just have to you know, say that in a nice way, of course, right? But you tell them, you know, you have to prove that you're strong enough. We can't rehabilitate you here in the hospital. You'll have to go to the nursing home if you don't want to go to physical therapy. Okay, so let's move into the uh, receptors now. We talked last time about... The differences of neurons, and this is like a really power-packed PowerPoint slide, like I said. What is this neuron up here? It's the lower, very good, lower motor neuron of the 
Somatic nervous system. Okay, it's a somatic motor neuron. What is it releasing? Acetylcholine. And what is its effect on muscle always? Excite or inhibit or both? Always excitatory. So you can maybe put a plus sign there, which means it's acetylcholine is all, or you can put it by the acetylcholine. It's always going to excite the neuron or excite the effector organ, I mean. So that always is the case. And then let's look at uh, the next one. What type of neurons are these? What type of neurons are these? All three of these are autonomic, but what about these two here? Sympathetic neurons, sympathetic neurons. And what do they release? Norepinephrine. And what is its effect on these organs? Both, plus or minus. Plus or minus, because is, is uh, norepinephrine going to stimulate the GI tract to digest? Is it going to cause the bladder to release? Is it going to cause the rectum to contract for bowel movement? No way. Nuh uh. Because, that sounded not very professional. <laughs> nuh uh. <laughs> but no, because we're not going to digest and try to have a bowel movement when we're fighting a bear or running away from a stressful situation. We want to direct that blood where? Where do we want to direct blood? in the sympathetic response? To the heart. To the heart and? Skeletal muscles, yeah. Okay, so that is going to be plus or minus depending on the organ. And this is a special neuron that we said is unique to the endocrine system. It's stimulated. What is the, what is the organ here that's being stimulated by a sympathetic neuron? Adrenal medulla, so the center of the adrenal gland. The outer part is called the cortex. The inner part is the medulla, and it secretes what hormones? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. So we call it capital N, capital E for norepinephrine. So that's what these green circles represent is norepinephrine. So both of those, again, are going to be positive or negative depending on the organ. And then this is what type of, what division? Parasympathetic. So the two neurotransmitters we can see are both acetylcholine and the effects here. It's the rest and digest. So is it going to increase my heart rate? Is it going to increase contraction in the digestive tract? Yes, so we can say it's plus or minus depending on the organ again. So both of these are plus or minus depending on the organ involved. Stimulate or inhibit depending. And again, it's important if we look at this list, comparing sympathetic to parasympathetic, that if I look at, say, the, the eye, for example, the iris of the eye that will either constrict or dilate, would you agree that it has parasympathetic neurons and sympathetic neurons? Yes. <coughs> definitely, definitely. And um, how about my blood vessels? Do my blood vessels have parasympathetic neurons and sympathetic neurons? Just sympathetic, yeah, because if we go to the sympathetic division, is that on there? Well, we had the skin on there. Blood vessels are not on there. Well, we'll talk about that. Blood vessels are an important sympathetically um, um, stimulated smooth muscle. So what happens if I block the sympathetic nervous system? open up, if I make it bigger, what happens to pressure? It goes down. It goes down. So if I dilate blood vessels, blood pressure goes down. And that's what happens when someone has an epidural. We find that it interferes with the sympathetic tone of the blood vessels and they're at risk of, of low blood pressure. So anybody who has an epidural, you know, during surgery or after surgery or um, during labor and delivery, they need to um, have constant blood pressure monitoring to make sure that that blood pressure is not dropping. And then we can treat it very quickly with a drug to increase blood pressure, a sympathetic acting drug, and we can control it. So it's not a big thing, but we just need to be aware of it. Okay, so let's talk about receptors then. And I have a handout for you. So if you could 
take one. If you don't have a two-sided handout, that's okay. We want the one with the brain on it and all the different um, infector cells. So I want to go back to these um, pictures as we reference the table. So we're going to kind of cycle back and forth between these. So there's different types of neurons <coughs> depending on what they release. So if we look at the parasympathetic division, looking at this chart, the parasympathetic neurons, both of them release what neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. So we call these neurons cholinergic neurons, cholinergic. So you could label that on this diagram right here, you could call it cholinergic, or you could label it here that these neurons are all cholinergic neurons. And it's spelled C-H-O-L-I-N-E-R-G-I-C. All cholinergic neurons because they both release acetylcholine. So we call them cholinergic neurons. So this is the, remember the, where the two meet? these cell bodies outside the central nervous system, what do we call these structures here? Ganglia. Yep, these are called ganglia. So when you're talking about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and looking at the neurons, we call this one the preganglionic neuron and this the postganglionic neuron. So if we go to this chart here, these yellow circles here, these are the ganglia. So again, this is the preganglionic neuron, postganglionic neuron. Preganglionic neuron, there is no postganglionic neuron in this one. This is preganglionic neuron, postganglionic neuron. And this is just lower motor neuron. Okay, so we can say that both the pre and the postganglionic neurons here are cholinergic. They all they both release acetylcholine. In the sympathetic nervous system, if we look at our diagram going back again here, the sympathetic, are they both cholinergic? No. This one releases norepinephrine or epinephrine, and another name for epinephrine is adrenaline. So we call this a cholinergic neuron because it releases acetylcholine, but this one releases norepinephrine or epinephrine, so this we, one we call an adrenergic neuron. Adrenergic means it releases epinephrine. Again, which we can also call adrenaline. So it's A-D-R-E-N-I-C, adrenergic. A-D-R-E-N-I-C. No, I... So this is an adrenergic neuron right here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Both. Yep. Yep. They both have the same effect on the receptor cell, though. So whether it's norepinephrine or epinephrine. Okay. So we can classify the neurons based on what neurotransmitter they release. Now, if you look at receptors, if we have a receptor that is a nicotinic receptor. That means it binds to acetylcholine and is excited by the acetylcholine if it's a nicotinic receptor. So if I go back to my chart, where I find nicotinic receptors would be here, skeletal muscle. There's nicotinic receptors on these cells to bind this acetylcholine, and it always stimulates, right? You put a little plus sign out here. So this is a nicotinic receptor. We see nicotinic receptors anywhere we see a, a snake in It depends on the receptor. It depends on the, the organ. Okay. So that's what this chart is going to help us decide. Okay, then on parasympathetic organs, which... Anything that is parasympathetic, so we go to this chart here, all of these organs here, it, 
bind acetylcholine. So all of these receptors here on all of these organs are muscarinic receptors. So I would label this chart so you can make this visual. All of these receptors are muscarinic receptors on these. So the iris of the eye, the pancreas, heart muscle cells, lungs, all are muscarinic. Now, are they going to be excitatory or, or inhibitory? Well, if you go back to this, what did you say about the parasympathetic nervous system on these organs? It depends, right? It really depends. <coughs> so if I go to my chart, it'll say excitation in most cases except for cardiac muscle. We're not going to um, stimulate that. And then if we look in the sympathetic nervous system, remember the blood vessels and sweat glands? Those will bind acetylcholine. And that would dilate the muscles, or I'm sorry, dilate the blood vessels or activate our sweat glands. So they have muscarinic receptors. So if we go to our chart here, right here. The sweat glands have muscarinic, so you could write muscarinic right there. And then you want to add another line for blood vessels. Or just write it off to the side. Blood vessels have muscarinic receptors. So what chart is it? I'm referring to this chart here in your notes. This one here? The sympathetic one, this picture, and then the parasympathetic. We're kind of cycling between these two. Okay. All right. Now, if we look at the neurotransmitters norepinephrine, where are we going to find these receptors? Which, which system of the autonomic? Which division of the autonomic? Sympathetic. Sympathetic. Yep. So we're going to go here. And we're going to find that the heart has beta-1 receptors to bind norepinephrine. So you're going to put beta-1 on the heart, just right next to it. Beta-1 receptors. Have you ever heard of a beta blocker? Okay, so that's a medicine like propanolol, metoprolol, that bonds to, it blocks, so it binds to the receptors for acetylcholine on the heart. So an acetyl, or I'm sorry, not acetylcholine, norepinephrine. So when norepinephrine is released, it wants to bind to the heart, but the heart receptors, those beta-1 receptors, are all full with propanolol. So therefore, it can't bind to those receptors. So then what happens to heart rate? Does it increase the heart? Nope. Contraction is hard? Nope. Because it's blocking. Okay. So, oops. Let's go back to our chart. So that's beta-1. Beta 2, we find on the lungs and most other organs that <coughs> respond to the sympathetic nervous system. So we find these on the blood vessels that serve the heart, liver, and skeletal muscle. So we find beta 2 on the blood vessels. You wrote that out here, right? Muscarinic responded to what neurotransmitter again? Acetylcholine. And the beta-2 will respond to norepinephrine. Very good. So those beta-2 receptors we find on the lungs and most of the other organs. And a good way to remember that, beta-1, how many hearts do we have? One. How many lungs do we have? Two. two. So think of it that way, beta-1. So we should write beta-2 on all the other organs? Well, it's most. So let's okay. look at the other, let's look at the exceptions to that. So beta-3 we find on fat cells, beta-3 receptors on fat cells. So if I release norepinephrine during the stress response, my fat cells are going to break down my fat and release what into the blood? Fatty acids and glycerol, which our metabolism can use to make glucose, right, and make ATP depending on what nutrient source, which glycerol or fatty acids. And then alpha-1 receptors we find on blood vessels in the skin, kidneys, salivary glands. So it's going to cause constriction, dilate the pupils of the eyes. 
So we're not going to have you memorize every single one, but let's just talk about the major ones. So why don't you just put alpha receptors here on the eyes. And the salivary glands. Is that the pancreas or a salivary gland? It's hard to see. kind of looks like a salivary gland to me. Alpha, yep. So you put alpha here and alpha here. So when you go to the doctor and they give you medicine to dilate your eyes, they are mimicking, their, that medicine is binding to what receptor? What receptor does that bind to if I'm dilating your eyes? The alpha, alpha 1 receptor in the salivary gland, yep, yep. So that's not going to affect my heart rate, is it? Because it only binds alpha receptors. It doesn't bind beta-1 receptors or beta-2 receptors. So it's just going to work on the iris of the eye. Now what I find that when I do that, it also binds salivary glands. And when I, when, the, when I stimulate the sympathetic response in a salivary gland, I get a dry, sticky saliva. So is it possible if I took this uh, medicine by mouth, that I could also end up with a dry, sticky mouth? Yeah, definitely. And if you look at, we'll, we'll talk about different medicines in a minute. So just keep that in mind. Um, and also, beta-1. Let's say I give someone just a general beta blocker, and what is that going to do to um, look at, like, skeletal muscle? Uh, beta blockers are something that people take when they, um, famous people, when they have to give a speech and they're really nervous and they don't want to be shaking up there as they're turning the pages and have their voice shaking, sometimes they'll give them a mild beta blocker to calm that sympathetic response down. But what's going to happen? What else can that do if I block these receptors, if it's a nonspecific beta blocker? What is it going to do to the blood vessels? Dilate them. What's going to happen to blood pressure then? could go down. So you have to be careful with those medicines. It's going to lower the blood pressure. Or let's say I'm trying to lower blood pressure in somebody. So I give them a beta blocker to lower their blood, blood pressure, but what does it do to the lungs? I'm sorry, what did you say? Dilates bron bronchioles and blood vessels. I'm going to open up the airways when I give. And isn't that what we give to people when they're having uh, anaphylaxis due to a bee sting? Don't we give them epinephrine, right? And doesn't that dilate the airways and allow them to breathe more easily? Definitely. What's that going to do to their heart rate, though? Increase it because it's going to bind to those beta-1 receptors on the heart. So when you give a medicine, you are affecting these receptors. And there's more also. But think of these receptors when you give a medicine that's going to act on either the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. For example, let's say you have an elderly woman who wants to go golfing with her friends, so she doesn't want her bladder to contract while she's out there golfing with her friends and becoming continent. So what do you want to block? What type of receptors on the bladder would you want to block? Acetylcholine receptors, but here's your choice of receptors. Which part, which system causes contraction of the bladder when it's activated? Do I want to be wetting my pants when I'm fighting or flighting? <laughs> so contraction of the bladder, contraction of the digestive tract, that's all parasympathetic. <coughs> so would I want to block the parasympathetic effects on the bladder while she's golfing? Definitely. So what, what, what receptor is what I want to block here? What type of receptor? I'm blocking these. What, what system I in, am I in here? Norepinephrine and epinephrine. What neurons secrete those, hor those hormones? Sympathetic. So this is all sympathetic response here. I want to block parasympathetic. So which of these two receptors is going to block the parasympathetic response on that bladder? Muscarinic, exactly. So I want to give a medicine that will block those receptors so they don't respond to acetylcholine and she doesn't contract. Now I might want to promote contraction of the bladder. And that would be in a patient who is an elderly male who's having trouble emptying his bladder because he has an enlarged prostate. 
So for him, I want to help him contract and empty his bladder. So I want to promote this. So I want to promote binding of muscarinic receptors by acetylcholine. And some of these medicines will bind to these receptors just like acetylcholine to get that response. Okay, so alpha-2 we find on axon terminals of the adrenergic neuron, which are these neurons, the axon terminals, and we find this in the pancreas. I wouldn't worry too much about those, but you should know the beta-1 and the alpha-1 receptors. Beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1, those are the three that you should know what's going on there. The beta-3 and alpha-2 are not as big of a deal. And the nicotinic and muscarinic are important because nicotinic are what we find on all of our skeletal muscle cells that respond to acetylcholine. And I hope that's the case, right, because that's the only neurotransmitter released by skeletal muscle neurons. So these are all nicotinic receptors here that all respond to acetylcholine, and they're always excitable. Okay, so if we go to different drugs then, if something... If something is a mimetic, a mimetic, that means it mimics the parasympathetic nervous system. So if I give someone pilocarpine, that is going to mimic the effects of acetylcholine on the eye. Table 14.3. That's going to open up the vessels that drains the aqueous humor to decrease pressure inside the eye. If I give someone a nicotinic agent, it's going to bind all those nicotinic receptors, and that's what a nicotine patch is. When I, buy, when I give someone a nicotine patch, that's what, when you smoke a cigarette, the nicotine binds to all your receptors, and where do we find nicotinic receptors? These are nicotinic receptors, right? And these are nicotinic receptors, right? Because they bind acetylcholine, and they are excitatory. So when a person smokes a cigarette, what does that do to uh, the adrenal medulla? It stimulates it to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. And we know that that does what to the heart? Increases the heart rate, increases uh, blood pressure, it has all those stress effects on the body. So even though people feel relaxed, nicotine in high doses gives a feeling of relaxation, you know, psychologically, but actually it's increasing heart rate, increasing blood pressure, and increasing the stress effects on the body. And that's why if you look at a person that's been smoking their entire lives, what does their skin look like? Wrinkled. It's, it's hard on the body. It's hard on the body because it's an inducing stress response. It's hard on the heart because it's increasing blood pressure and heart rate. So it's binding these nicotinic receptors. So when you give someone a nicotine patch, that is going to help them deal with that addiction to nicotine while they're getting used to not doing this all the time, right? Because there's a lot of psychological you know, um, attraction to just you know, moving the cigarette back and forth into the mouth. So while they deal with finding other things to do, they're dealing with their nicotine addiction, and they can slowly taper. When people try to taper by saying, well, I'm going to go to the light cigarettes, or I'm going to smoke fewer cigarettes, what they've done, what they've found when they've done research is people actually take longer draws and smoke those cigarettes um, more quickly so they, to get the same nicotine effects. So if a person truly wants to taper, they have to kick the cigarettes, go to the nicotine patch, and follow the directions on the package for tapering because that's how we can truly taper off of, a, of an addictive chemical like nicotine is. So that's why you know, they call these nicotine receptor, nicotinic receptors because not only do they bind acetylcholine, they also bind, nico bind nicotine. So we don't want to forget about the nicotine patch on our patients. That happens. You, know, you slap one on, and then you forget about it. Where did it go? Oh, I don't remember where it is. And they don't remember that, that someone put it on, and you didn't read the chart. You know, that's too long for that to be on there if they're trying to taper. Or if someone's in the hospital, and they're a you know, three-pack-a-day smoker, and now you're going to tell them, well, you're just not going to smoke now? That's crazy. <laughs> have them go through withdrawal at the same time as they're having, you know, blood pressure issues or maybe just had surgery and they're dealing with pain. You want them withdrawing from nicotine at the same time. So we need to be honest and say, hey, I see you're a smoker. 
would you want us to give you a nicotine patch? How are you doing without being able to smoke right now? You know, if they're on oxygen, you don't want them smoking. So um, we need to deal with those um, addictions so we can get them to heal and then deal with the smoking addiction later. Okay, so going back, um, acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So here's where we're going to block the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine because we're going to inhibit that enzyme from doing its job. Because what does acetylcholine esterase do? <coughs> Breaks down acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction is where it's really important, but anywhere. So if we don't want it to break down, let's say you have a disease called myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disease where you lose receptors for acetylcholine on the neuromuscular junction, we might inhibit that enzyme. So whatever acetylcholine binds to whatever receptors are left, it can stay there and do its job and allow contraction to occur. So we give this medicine, this neostigmine, to people with myasthenia gravis to keep that acetylcholine bound for a longer period of time so they can get a little more muscle strength back. Because these people you lose the ability to swallow. I mean, eating becomes really difficult because they lose those, um, that, that muscle strength. Their eyes also get droopy as well because the, the muscles, those are really weak muscles. You think about your very weakest muscles, the weak muscles of the eyelid are the weakest muscles. So if you start to lose strength, you're going to see it in the eyelids. You're going to start to see droopy eyes. And then sympathomimetic agents, these are things that are going to act like the sympathetic nervous system. So they're going to bind to adrenergic receptors, anything that binds norepinephrine. So that's what albuterol does. Albuterol binds to beta-2 receptors. And where do we find beta-2 receptors? Find them in the blood vessels and heart, lungs, also in the heart itself. So what happens when a person does their albuterol? It's going to dilate those airways so they can breathe better. What happens when I check their heart rate? I had um, walking pneumonia in college, and I developed asthma as a symptom of that, and I was given a albuterol um, inhaler to deal with that, and I, my heart rate, I must be really sensitive, my heart rate went way up, and I was all shaky, and I felt sick to my stomach, and I thought, oh my gosh, I thought felt terrible before this. Now I can breathe well, but I feel horrible everywhere else, so... That was a struggle. So then I didn't take that. So then I felt, you know, I was really asthmatic and had a hard time breathing. And then I ended up reacting to my antibiotic, which made me sick. So now not only being able to breathe, I was throwing up. And ugh, I was all by myself at the time. It was, it was a tough day. But anyway, um, when you think about these medicines, then think about all the effects of those medicines, not just on what you're treating, but what else is going to happen as a result of that. And then sympatholytic Agents. These are things, again, that are going to lice or block the sympathetic nervous system. So here they're blocking either the receptors by binding to those receptors, or they're going to block the release of norepinephrine from those neurons. And like we've talked about beta blockers, propanolol is a popular one that was used. Not as much anymore. Now we have metoprolol, which is more popular. But um, they're going to decrease heart rate and blood pressure because you're blocking the sympathetic nervous system on those patients. Another one, um, nasal decongestant, binding to alpha-1 receptors. Phenylephrine is something that we give that helps to open up the vessels that causes um, stuffy nose. Yeah, similar, pseudoephedrine, yeah, similar medicine. Um, so let's see what's, um, yeah, okay. So these are just... I don't expect you to memorize these medicines. This is not nursing school. This is not a pharmacology class, right? So I'm not going to ask you this. But what I could tell you, I could say that, um, like, pilocarpine is given to an individual to enhance the uh, parasympathetic response and drain the uh, aqueous humor. What receptors does pilocarpine bind to? And if you know the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system, on the eye, then you could say muscarinic receptors. So I'll give you the medicine, tell you what it does, and you have to decide is that parasympathetic or sympathetic, and if it's parasympathetic, 
the choice is muscarinic receptors, right? And if it's sympathetic, your choice is one of these. And I said you only had to know three, beta 1, beta 2, and alpha 1. Parasympathetic, it's only going to be muscarinic. Because if you look at these, I mean, if you're talking about the target organ, the target organ, they're all muscarinic. Because all parasympathetic target organs are muscarinic. So if we go back to our <coughs> diagram, if you didn't label this yet, you could put, um, must have, these all have muscarinic receptors. All of these have muscarinic receptors. So the more you can just make a blanket statement for something, the easier it is to remember for the test, right? Because trying to memorize this table, if you're going to look at this table and try to memorize that, that's a huge undertaking. It's easier just to look at this. So what did we say about this? You tell me, what did you write down for the parasympathetic nervous system based on today's information? What new information did you add today? What? Cholinergic neuron. C H O L I N E R G I C. These are all cholinergic neurons. They all release acetylcholine, pre and post ganglionic. What'd you say, Summer? Yep, and the target organs, so all the pictures you see, all those organs have muscarinic receptors. So that's kind of two blanket statements you can make from today's discussion. And then for the sympathetic, a little more tricky, right? So what type of neurons are these? Adrenergic neurons, all the light green ones, excuse me, all the light green ones, not this one, that's going to the adrenal medulla. All the light green neurons here are adrenergic neurons that release norepinephrine, yep, norepinephrine, and all these neurons are let's go back to here to remind ourselves what do these release? ACH. So all three, all four of these here are all what type of neurons? Cholinergic because they all release acetylcholine, all four of these. So these are all cholinergic. <coughs> What is this? Cholinergic. So again, if you're trying to less, what do I need to know? One sentence. The postganglionic sympathetic neuron is adrenergic. That's it. Everything else? Cholinergic, right? So do I need to memorize which ones are <coughs> cholinergic? No. All I need to remember is this is the one that's adrenergic. Everything else is cholinergic. So you just reduced a lot of information that you need to know by just looking for patterns. This is the only one that's adrenergic. <coughs> okay, so anything else for the heart has what type of receptors? Beta 1 for the heart muscle itself and the blood vessels leading to the heart? Beta 2 and, but we're not talking about parasympathetic, so okay. the muscarinic part would go here. But yes, there are muscarinic receptors, but, but keep that on this slide so you're thinking parasympathetic when you think muscarinic. Okay, and then the ones on the lung, beta 2, and a majority, except for which ones contain those alpha receptors? Salivary, the alpha one, salivary glands, eyes, and blood vessels of the skin. Alpha one, yep. That's in skeletal muscle. So the 
salivary glands for alpha-1, salivary glands, blood vessels of the skin. <clears throat> generalized blood vessels. Um, like blood vessels of your digestive tract. It's going to constrict them because we don't want to digest. That's why if, you're, if you eat breakfast and you go for a long, hard exercise, you feel sick to your stomach because you're, you're, that food is sitting there and there's not enough blood flow to keep the digestive processes going. So people are going to throw up. Like if you go to cross-country meets, the kids eat on the bus or eat after school and they go to a cross-country meet and really push themselves, end up throwing up after because they were eating and then doing that big exercise. Or worse yet, you get muscle cramps because the blood vessels are going to your, or the blood flow is going to your stomach and not to your muscles, so then you get muscle cramps. So it's one of two things can happen if you're eating that the two systems have a hard time working together <coughs> during a tense exercise. Okay, so um, just I would say you should have a general sense of what happens to these major organs. So this is a table that you should be able to predict what is going to happen. And again, if you're thinking rest and digest, just apply that thinking for the parasympathetic effects it's not going to be that hard to remember. If I'm resting and digesting, do I need to breathe really well? No. If I'm fighting or flighting, do I want to open up my airway so I can get good oxygen? Definitely. Um, so if I'm resting and digesting, do I want to think about going to the bathroom? No. And that's where, this is the classic example of that. It's time to go somewhere. Maybe this happened to you as a kid or if you have young children or even yourself. You're busy, you're getting ready for work. Oh, I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready, I'm getting late, I'm getting ready. Okay, then you go and you go and you go and then finally you sit down and you drive in the car and you start to relax. It's like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. I forgot about that. Right? Now you've got a long drive. There's no stops on the way. Well, that's what happens to kids, too. It's like, come on, take your suitcase, get your stuff. We're going, we're going, this, this, this. Then you get in the car and you drive away and they say, I have to go to the bathroom. And you get mad about that. But the reality is it's blame the autonomic nervous system because when they're moving around and running around the house, they're not thinking about going potty until they relax and then it empties. Or same thing with kids that are running around in the playground and they come in and all of a sudden they've got wet pants now. And that's because they were running around and not feeling that sensation of bladder contraction until it became so intense that the micturition reflex just takes over. Okay, so again, we know that the sweat glands, the adrenal medulla, and the skin do not have parasympathetic innervation. Same thing with the blood vessels serving the heart. But most of the time, we have, like I said, dual innervation. The sympathetic nervous system is doing its thing, and the parasympathetic nervous system is doing its thing. We, we don't have, it's not a one or the other type of situation, outside of the ones I just mentioned. We have dual innervation. Both are secreting their neurotransmitters, and those target organs are responding, so we have a little bit of both. And here's a classic example. The heart beat is normally about 100 beats per minute is what the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the heart to beat at 100 beats per minute. But because of the parasympathetic neurons also serving the heart muscle, it brings that rate down to about 70 beats per minute. So if we take off the parasympathetic effects and we just look at the heart rate itself, it would be a lot higher. So we have both going on. <coughs> So one quick reference to visceral reflexes, remember that we can have a sensory receptor <coughs> in the walls of our organs. And what would they be? In most cases, if we're talking about the bladder, the stomach, the blood vessels, anywhere there's smooth muscle, stretch receptors. Yeah, stretch receptors. And when that stretch goes down, it's going to stimulate a visceral reflex to increase the activity, say for the heart. If blood vessel, the stretch goes down in our blood vessels, blood pressure is falling, that's going to stimulate the heart to increase the contraction. So let's say you have a person that's dehydrated and there's less stretch in the blood vessels because they've lost a lot of fluid from their blood vessels. What would we expect heart rate to look like in someone who's dehydrated? 
be higher because this visceral reflex is trying to kick things in and get that heart rate, that, that blood pressure up by incre uh, uh, increasing contraction of the heart. So when a kid comes in, um, or your own kids, or yourself, or a friend, relative, says, I think I'm dehydrated, I might need to go in and get an IV fluid replacement, check their heart rate. That'll tell you if they're classically dehydrated and they have low blood volume. That's when we get concerned and say we need to you know, give you IV fluids. But if their heart rate is normal, then they could probably, they're not at that point of losing blood volume, they could probably just try to rehydrate orally. Because that's the best way to rehydrate. Getting an IV and trying to absorb it through your blood vessels is a little bit more difficult and not as efficient as hydrating by mouth. So when, we, when moms run their kids to the doctor saying, you know, he's dehydrated and she just needs IV fluids, that's not the best way to rehydrate. It's a slower process. It's better to do it through the digestive tract. So you want to try to do that first before you end up going into the ER. Okay, so, so this would be some receptor for stretch in the smooth muscle, or again, it can be anything. It can be concentration of solutes, and that's going to stimulate the kidneys to absorb or not absorb um, sodium or potassium from the blood in the renal tubules. It could be any um, receptor. And then again, we have a sensory neuron, then we have the inner neuron, the integration, and then the response to the effector organ. So you don't need to know any detail here, but just know that we have visceral reflexes acting just like we have the somatic reflexes to keep and maintain homeostasis. And then when you talk about referred pain, we find that the neurons that serve the organs have the same pathway as sensory neurons from the skin and muscle. So basically what that means is if I'm having a heart attack, I'm going to find that I have pain. So the blue areas are where you're going to have pain. So if I'm having a heart attack, I'm going to find that I have pain along the left arm. And where else? In the jaw. Yep. Some people think they have a toothache when actually it's a heart attack. And we see that more in women. Women have more jaw pain compared to chest pain. Sometimes they don't have any pain at all. Women's symptoms of heart attack are quite different than men's. Sometimes they have just a feeling of digestive upset and just feeling off. So they'll go and lay down. Nauseous. Yep, nauseous. They'll go and lay down, and then they'll have a major heart attack and die. Women are more likely to die from their first heart attack than men are. And also, think about the relationships in the house of men and women. Who's taking care of who when it comes to health stuff? Who says, you need to go to the doctor? Women do that, right? So if a man is acting off or looks funny, she's going to say, I don't like the way you look. Or, honey, you've been talking about that pain for a while. I think we need to be seeing it. I'm making you an appointment today. Does that happen with men as much? No. So that's, you know, unfortunately the way it tends to be. Um, if you look at the gallbladder, so the gallbladder is here. People tend to have pain in the right shoulder. Or if we look here, too, this is actually a little more accurate. The gallbladder is tucked up under the liver on the right side. So if you have gallbladder pain, you tend to have right shoulder pain as well. So people come in and say, oh, I just have this rather achy feeling right here. Every time I eat, I get this pain here. Well, that's gallbladder. So we call this referred pain. So it's the same. It's the sensory neurons that serve the organs have the same pathway into the spinal cord for sensory neurons in the skin and muscle. <clears throat> so a test question might be a uh, person with a inflamed gallbladder complains of right shoulder pain. The right shoulder pain is an example of blank. And the answer would be referred pain. So it's an easy question, just so you know what referred pain means and an example of it. So levels of autonomic nervous system control. Let's now we're going to zoom out and look at the big picture, looking at, at the forest. So if we look at in the middle here, do you remember what is the boss of the autonomic and the endocrine system? The hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus has these receptors constantly sampling the plasma and receiving input from sensory neurons about what's the status of this body right now. What is the pressure? What is the stretch 
in the blood vessels, what is the level of solutes in the plasma, what is the hormone, would be an example of a solute, hormone levels, ion concentration, temperature, what's the temperature of this blood, all of that information is being uh, integrated at the thalamus. But we can override that input by thinking. So this is the cerebral, go ahead. Hypothalamus, hypothalamus. Yes, yes, it does. Yep, yep. Temperature receptors, you know, for looking at what is our set point. You know, 98.6 is ideal, but we can vary a little bit on either side of that and still be normal. Yep, so it's like our, our, our thermostat for the body, so definitely. So we have higher brain centers that are conscious that can give feedback to the hypothalamus. And the cerebral cortex is top dog. That's our thinking brain, right? So if you saw something stressful, if you have a person that passed away that you were really close to and they just walked in the room and said, hey, how are they? You'd be really upset, and your cortex would cause a stress response, and heart rate would go up, blood pressure would go up, your stomach might feel funny, your salivary glands would stop secreting a watery, viscous um, saliva. So that is a cerebral cortex overriding that because you're thinking about something stressful. Or even if you're in a bad pattern right now in your personal life, bad relationships, work situation, financial situations, that can override the hypothalamus and cause imbalance of sympathetic and parasympathetic responses and stimulus. So that's the cerebral cortex. And another structure is a little deeper in the brain. It's called the limbic system. And it's a collection. I don't expect you to know the different parts of the limbic system. It's not important for our purposes. And I don't even know what they are either. I could look it up. and It's in your book. But it's just a, it's different regions of the brain that we call our emotional brain. And it has a lot to do with strong drives. For example, um, sexual drives, hunger drives um, for extreme hunger, um, uh, desire for intercourse, and um, that just kind of feel good emotion, like when you see a, a really cute little kitten, you know, you feel this overwhelming emotion of, oh, it's so cute, or a baby, right? Oh, that extreme flood of emotion and serotonin is the limbic system. It's our emotional brain, we call it. And that, too, can override the hypothalamus. So, again, uh, extreme needs for, for food, you know, overeating and or if you've been hungry and you have a strong drive to eat a really big, fatty, greasy, salty meal, that's the limbic system. It's not a need of your body. It's an overdrive that can affect parasympathetic and sympathetic effects. And then we have the brainstem, which is subconscious. So we talked about the medulla in general A&P, how it controls heart rate, blood vessel diameter, respiratory rate, how often you inhale and exhale is controlled by the brainstem. It's the medulla and the pons working together to drive your respirations. So that's all below the level of our consciousness. So the hypothalamus will stimulate the medulla. In some cases, in some cases it's a reflex, but oftentimes the hypothalamus provides input to the medulla. And then we have reflexes at the spinal cord level that affect the parasympathetic nervous system. For example, um, <coughs> erection um, of the clitoris and of the penis during sexual arousal is a reflex. Now, can a male or female have erection of those structures by thinking about it? Looking, no touch, nothing involved, but just thinking? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. But it's also a reflex. So a person can think about it, but also mm -hmm. if there's mm -hmm. stimulation, we have sensory input coming in, because right, what is their visceral reflex? Their visceral reflex is this. So you can have sensory information coming into the spinal cord, going right back out and causing um, erection of the clitoris and penis that can happen without involvement of higher brain centers. The same thing with ejaculation and orgasm. It's a reflex, but it's a sympathetic reflex. So again, if you have enough input coming in to those organs, you can have ejaculation occur. So can a quadriplegic father a child without special intervention? Yes, because it's a reflex. 
but can you get complete oops can you get complete um, erection with uh, sensory information alone some better than others so some men that do want to father children that are quadriplegic sometimes they need extra help achieving erection but they can many can ejaculate and father children without special intervention because of that can't feel it they're not enjoying it's it there, it's enjoying there but they're not enjoying it yeah I mean they can see it you know think about it, it. Think about it but, but they're not really getting the sensory yeah. information yeah <laughs> they're not getting that sensory so um, so that anyway just think about right here is where the, the integration system is but it's influenced by our thoughts and emotions and we also have lower centers that are beyond our control thank goodness for that that's keeping us alive while we're in bed at night 